And just before Maureen speaks to us, I'm just going to read um, from Jeremiah chapter 18 and verses 1 to 6. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was make, <coughs> making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Says the Lord, Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Heavenly Father, we just pray for Maureen now as she comes to speak to her to us and Lord we just ask again that you will give us listening ears to hear what you have to say to each one of us individually this morning. Lord we just pray that you will just bless her as she brings your word to us in Jesus name. Amen. Just get myself organised here. I want to start off by saying thank you to everybody for allowing me to come along and share with you this morning. Um, most of you know I'm the minister of Leavesden Road Baptist Church and uh, since the beginning of the first lockdown we haven't managed to go back to church at all. So all of our services are produced in my lounge, in my flat, and uh, I pre-record them and put them up onto YouTube so people can uh, watch them at any time. One of the benefits of that is that Sunday mornings are free for me. <laughs> so I've been able to sometimes join in bushy services and services in other churches, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that, both as somebody who, as it were, sits in the congregation but occasionally goes to places to be able to preach. But this is the first time in over a year I've actually preached in a church, <laughs> as opposed to to myself on my computer with nobody else. So as much as there might be little response from the few people who are here, it's far more than I get in my lounge. <laughs> so to the passage for today, many of you will know that um, I used to live in Pakistan. Let's see if this works. Hooray. I used to live in Pakistan, um, and for the latter part of my time there, um, I lived up in the foothills of the Himalayas. Beautiful place to live. I used to look out on those beautiful mountains from my bedroom window. My office looked out onto more mountains. Beautiful. As part of uh, my role in that part of the country, I was to go out and speak with people who lived around us, as well as teaching in the school that I was uh, assigned to. Just down the road from where I lived, there was a potter, and he had a shop. And I went along there quite frequently, and I used to buy pottery from him. Anybody who's seen my house on Zoom, you probably see it in the background. There's lots of blue and white pottery, and that's the pottery that comes from this very potter's shed that I've referred to. The man in there would make me gifts and presents for the potter. And here's some of the things, oh, she says, hoping it will go. It's not going on. There we go. So blue and white pottery and uh, lots of different things. And he was always looking for new ideas of how he could use the same traditional skills that he'd heard of to make new things. And I was the one who gave him those ideas. They never quite turned out how I pictured them. 
but that's because he was the potter, not me. And some of the things I was trying to suggest that he might make were things that he knew were not good ideas for pottery. But in my house, I have a clock that's made of this pottery. I have a tea service made of this pottery. I have mugs. I have a vase. From time to time, I myself went in and had a go. I wasn't very good at it, needless to say. And for me, as I was coming to do some of that pottery and in his place, there were times when I would just want to give up. And he'd say, no, no, it's OK. Keep going. And then we, I would get so far, and there'd be a bit on the side, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I would pick it up and go to throw it away and discard it. And he'd say, no, 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 don't discard it. You can make something from that. Now, I bought a piece of my pottery with me, and it's here. Now, most of you probably can hardly see it because it's so small. But that's the point. Because the piece of discarded clay that I tried to throw away the day I tried it, the potter then took that piece of discarded clay and made this for me. It's a candlestick. And when you live in a place that doesn't have electricity very often, this is a very important thing. But it was made out of the castaway pottery, the castaway clay that to me meant nothing. But to the potter, it meant something. There's my introduction. Now let's get to the passage. I love Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of my favourite prophets, partly because he's got lots of hopeful things that he says in his prophecies. And we often pick up on those and we take them. How many of us know that verse? I am doing a new thing in you. And we quote it all the time. How many of us have read this passage that we heard of today and we claim it all the time for ourselves, that he is the potter and we are the clay. But you know what? That was Jeremiah giving a prophecy in the midst of chaos, in the midst of things falling apart. His ministry went across many years. It started in the time when Josiah was bringing reform and trying to get people to come back to God. It carried on later on in Jehoiakim's time. Read his prophecies. They're great. It even has a ministry that he has for the people when they're in exile. The worst thing that they can think of. And he says that verse that we quote so often, I have a plan for you to prosper you. He says that to them while they're in exile. That's the context of it. So it's disastrous as far as they're concerned. But Jeremiah reminds them in various contexts why it is that they need to continue to trust in God and return to him. And this passage is no different. So as I look at it, I see three different things that I want us to look at today. The potter, the potter's will, and the clay. And you'll all have heard sermons on this before, and you will not be surprised at who I think is who. But the potter is God, the creator of all things, who wants to take and mould us. The potter's will, our life circumstance. And the clay, that's us. We have to remember that it's the potter who has absolute control over the clay in that context. But if that potter does not focus completely on what they're doing, the clay will slip off. God is always there with us, but he holds us with a loose rein, because we are allowed to make decisions for ourselves, to make choices. The clay is in his hands, and he wants to make a vessel out of each one of us. 
That was the message that Jeremiah was to give to the people. You have turned against me, God was saying to them. You've longed after things that are not within the covenant relationship that we agreed. You've longed to be somebody that you shouldn't be. I love that point in Iris's uh, testimony earlier on, that when she was in the grey mode, she longed after things like the best of everything, the latest phone, this, that and the other. Nothing wrong with any of those things in and of themselves, but that desire that you should be part of the cool group, that you should be longing after those things. But when God enters us and we look for a relationship with him, those things are nothing. And this is what this picture of this potter in the potter's house, this is the picture that's given here. He says, you're like a lump of clay. Now notice when God says to Jeremiah, did you, uh, could I not mould you in the same way? He doesn't say, I will mould you in the same way, like it or lump it. What he's saying is he is the sovereign God and he has the capability of doing that. But we have this thing called free choice and sometimes we choose the wrong things. But in this picture, he wants to say, come back to me, hold on to me, be, let me mould you into what I want. Don't try and be what the world wants. Let me mould you. So there's the potter, who is God, and he has ultimate control. He is sovereign and can control the uh, clay, but the clay needs to be pliable and ready to be moulded. There's a sense when you think about the potter and the clay that this potter has an intense interest in the clay. Immediately you see that wheel spinning and you see the clay on it and he's got it positioned. You can see the focus is on that creation and only that creation. And primarily the potter's the only one that will know from the beginning what it's gonna look like at the end. Well, if it were mine, nobody would know what it was gonna look like at the end. But a professional potter, they have a good idea of what it would look like. My friend the potter, who lived down the road, he would say to me, there is no point in making something that is sitting on the side and pretty just for the sake of it being pretty. It needs to have a use. What's the point, he would say of making something just for the sake it's pretty. He had no sense that to make something that was pretty, that was fine, but it had to have a use as well. We are his workmanship. God puts time and effort into us. He takes patience and has patience with the clay. The people of Israel and each one of us, if we're honest, are people who don't always follow exactly the way God would want us to. Even if in our hearts we really want to do that, we don't always. But we also know that there's a need for us to follow after him and he wants to mould us and we'll take patience. Whenever the people went away, God said, I'll still be here. I don't know about you, but for me, sometimes it's like being on the potter's wheel where you're being molded, but you don't know quite what you wanna be at the end of it. You want God to mold you, but you actually can't cope with the process. That brings me on to the wheel the potter's wheel spins. One of the other things I learned from my potter friend was that the wheel spins at different speeds dependent on what 
the creator, the potter, is doing to the piece of clay at times. Now, for all of us, probably in this day and age, just right now, with all that's going on around us, and probably for the last year, we're feeling a bit dizzy. You know, I used to use the phrase, stop the world, I want to get off. Well, maybe here it's the, stop the potter's wheel, I want to get off. And more than being centred in the middle, we feel like we're at the edge of the potter's wheel and we're holding off, holding on for dear life rather than being sent off into oblivion. But you know what? The potter says, it's okay that I'm here to grab hold and to bring you back into the centred place. When you think about it, that's exactly what happens with God. That's what he's saying in this passage. He's talking about the clay that is marred, that is ruined to all intents and purposes. That isn't a fresh piece of clay. But he doesn't put it away. He reworks that ruined, marred clay. And God is saying to the people through Jeremiah, and he's saying to us today, you may have gone away. You may have turned your back on me. You may never have acknowledged me ever. You may see yourself as a marred piece of clay. But, says God, I am reaching out to you. I am here and ready to centre you back in the middle of the wheel so that I can rework you and remould you into the beautiful vessel that I want to use. The circumstances of our life will bring us to the point where we may be crying out to God. The trials that we feel in our lives will be those where we want to cry out to God. And he says, it's okay, I'm here. I can take out all those bubbles. I can take out the stones that have marred you. I can rework this piece of clay in order to make you the person, the vessel that I want to use. Trials is something we all know about. But God says, I'm there beside you. Sometimes it's rebuke, and that's what this was that Jeremiah was bringing to the people. It was a rebuke because they had gone against him. It was a rebuke to them that they needed to have more faith in God. They needed to trust in him. And if that meant walking blindly, it meant walking blindly. But they needed to do it. And God was rebuking them. And sometimes in our lives, God rebukes us. But in that rebuke, there is always, as Jeremiah constantly does, a hope that is prophesied, a hope that is given, that God is there and he is the one who will reform, who will reshape, who will remould to create that special thing. And our circumstances, every single person that Jeremiah was talking to in that day and age, had their own reasons for the actions that they took. Every single one of us have circumstances in our lives that may come between us and our God and relationship that we have with him. But God says, trust me in the midst of that. I want to just give a quick illustration here um, of walking blindly with God. Going back to my potter friend, his daughter was getting married once. Now, he had this potter's house just along from where I live, but his family lived down the mountainside. I was 7,000 feet up, was where my house was at that point. And his family lived down the mountainside, and he invited us to the wedding in this house. We walked to the edge where he met us and he said, I will be your guide to get to the house. We had one torch between seven of us. 
And he said to us, there are no lights on this pathway. There is nothing that you can see at all. But I have a torch, he said. So he lined us up with a hand on each, like one hand on the shoulder of the person in front of us. And then he was at the front with the torch, which he put behind him so that somebody could see rather than him. And he walked. Now, he walked this path every day. He knew it well. It took us 45 minutes, but we walked with him blindly, not knowing where we were going. We had a great time. We stayed the night rather than walk back up in the dark. It was about 1,000 feet down the mountainside that we had walked. And the next morning, when we got up, this was the path that we saw. This was the widest part of the path that we saw. And we had walked a thousand feet down and were very grateful none of us had gone over the edge. But we trusted him because he knew the way and he did it every day and he was the one with the torch. Sometimes, in the midst of the shaping and remoulding of us, we have to trust in God blindly. And in these days, in this last year, and in the coming days, isn't that what we're doing? Trusting God blindly for what the future might hold for each and every one of us. Certainly, I know that's the case in our church at Leavesden Road. We are trusting God to show us that way. But then we get to the point of we've got God the potter and the wheel and all the spinning and all that happens there. And we come to the point where we are the clay that he is molding. What should our response be? I think that we need to see ourselves as something with potential. I used to hate that word when I was at school. It often appeared on my report. Maureen has great potential. She doesn't always meet it. But God sees the potential even in me. And he's willing to use it. Even if I can't see it, God can see the potential in me. God can see the potential in you. He could see the potential, if you like, in the people who had turned from him. And he gives Jeremiah this picture to put over to them and to talk to them about. Here we have this verse, and it comes from Isaiah. We are the clay, and he is the potter. And as we draw this to a close, I want us to think and apply this to ourselves as individuals. As you're sitting, whether you're at home, or whether you're here in the church building, I want you to think and visualise. We heard that earlier on, didn't we, with Barry? He was talking about what we can visualise in our minds. I, I want you to visualise the potter's will. I want you to visualise yourself as the clay on the potter's will. I want you to visualise God looking down on you as you are there on the potter's wheel. And it may be that today you have come to this place and come to the place where you feel that life's a bit of a dizzy whirl and that that potter's wheel, if you like, is moving a lot faster than you would like it to. It's going at such a speed that you can hardly recognise things that are going round. You see them, but they whiz by, and you don't understand what's going on. Remember, if that's how you feel today, that God the potter is there to keep you centred if you just rely on him, even if it means walking blindly with him and trust in him. In the midst of all of that whirling around, 
in the midst of all of the uncertainty, God is there to keep you centred. Now, it may be that for you, the wheel is not turning quite so speedily. It may be that the wheel is a lot slower. And perhaps you even think, God's put me to one side. He hasn't got a use for me because I'm not in the Russian world of what's going on. And you're disappointed because you think maybe God thinks you're worthless. Maybe God doesn't want you to be part of his plan anymore. Maybe he has nothing for you. Maybe you even question whether he's deserted you. If my Potter friend were here today, he would tell you that the wheel slows down at the point that the potter needs to put the finer details onto the pot. If there is something intricate that needs to be done, the wheel has to slow often in order for him to be able to do that. God wants to create each of us as individuals and as a church as you look to the future and the new minister that you're going to have as you continue to be God's people here in this place. He wants to mould and shape every single individual in order to be able to mould and shape the wider church, in order to be able to mould and shape this community, Watford and everyone in it, and indeed the whole world. God, the creator, says, come back to me. Let me reshape you. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in today, may you know God's hand upon you. May you know him really working in you and through you. Just come to him and say, I want you to show me your vision for me as the potter. I want to be that clay that's pliable and mouldable in your hands. Amen. Amen.